Oh, uh oh, something's wrong. Well, hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to International Live Stream Star Party. I'm Amy Oliver from the Lawrence Whipple Observatory, and I'm your host for this evening. We have a really amazing lineup planned for. Um, Huh. Okay. I, I'm here live. I'm not a cat. <laughs> okay, well, you're gonna figure this out on the back end, everybody. But in the meantime, let me kind of tell you what we're going to do tonight, okay? We have an excellent lineup. First, you're gonna hear from me about the Perseverance Rover or Perseverance Rover. We're just having a good laugh about that on the back end here because we keep switching the pronunciation. And hopefully I'm gonna be giving that to you as a person and not as a cat. We'll find out. Yes, we'll all find out together. I'm, I'm the tech lead tonight, so we'll figure this out. And then we are going right over to Florida where we're going to start looking at some amazing objects for the evening with Frank Kane from the Central Florida Astronomical Society, I think also representing tonight for the Immobiliar Planetarium on Derek Demeter's behalf because he could not be here. And then we'll head over to Virginia with Brian Cummins, who is a solar system ambassador. And then we'll head out to Arizona and see John Carter Sr. from the Prescott Astronomy Club. And if we have time left over, me also, hopefully not as a cat, might show off a couple of extra um, objects. So, for just a second, I'm gonna turn it over to Frank or Brian or somebody and see if they can talk while I get myself out of this mess. <laughs> All right, while Amy's uh, transforming back into human form, just a sneak peek what we're gonna be looking at tonight after the talk. Uh, we got some good live footage here of the uh, Jellyfish Nebula and uh, we're gonna try to get the Muggy Head Nebula too and look at Mars and see how that looks like through a telescope too. And hey, you're, you're a person again. I, I might be. We'll, we'll see in just a second here. Here we go. I'm a person. But you can go ahead and show off that object while I queue up the presentation anyway. Oh, okay. We'll, uh, we'll go out of order here. So, you know, we're going to be talking about Mars tonight, right? So one thing I wanted to show you guys was uh, what you can actually see from your driveway here on Earth when you're looking at Mars at just the right time. So quick shot of a picture I took of Mars last September here uh, from my light polluted driveway. Great thing about planets is that they're so bright, you can pretty much image them from anywhere if you got the right equipment and the right timing. And timing was everything for this because in September, Mars was still pretty close to the Earth. This was just a couple of months after um, we actually launched the Mars 2020 mission off to Mars. So it was at a time when Mars and Earth were pretty close. And that means that we can get a really good view out of it from the Earth. So, you know, there is a bunch of image processing that goes on to get this much detail. Uh, but the fact that you can see actual features on Mars, given that it's such a small planet compared to Earth, I think is really exciting. And, you know, I, I don't really know my Mars geography that well, but you can see Olympus Mons there up in the upper right there, uh, the, uh, the Great Valley to going down the, the center of the planet there and the Southern Polar Cap, of course, over there as well. And next to it is the planet Uranus. It uh, wasn't actually that close to the planet uh, in the sky. It's a composite, but I took that on the same night too. And I think it's also pretty cool that this gas giant that's so incredibly far away, you can still capture the roundness of it and that really beautiful uh, teal color of it as well. I think it's just one of the most gorgeous colors in the night sky. And Amy, if you're ready to uh, get started with your talk, we can uh, come back to me later for the next object. Still going? Uh, yep, I was on mute. Give me just a second here. We're gonna. All right. I, I, it's always that two screen. You know, when you are the presenter and the tech, something yep. always goes wrong. The computer screen just disappeared. It well, a quick like, plug for the uh, Central Florida Astronomical Society, which I'm representing here tonight. If you are in Central Florida, head on over to cfast.org to learn more about us and join the cool kids. Oh, I love it. The cool kids. That's our new motto. I just made it up. All right. Let's see. So now I think I think I'll be okay. I might need a little guidance. I'm not usually the person who does. Um, you know what I mean? I'm not. I'm not usually the person running the presentation. So if we need a little 
we might need a little bit of guidance on how to show one side. <laughs> if I put it on presenter view, will you guys see? What will you guys see? <laughs> That's one way that to find is out. A million dollar <laughs> question. And now I'm stuck in here. Someone get me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I can go on to the next object if you want, Amy, if you need some more time. Uh, I might need you to do that simply because I am stuck in the, uh, okay, actually I got it. Okay. Cool. So, well, maybe I got it. Let's see. Go on to the next object because I'm going to mess around with this for a second and see um, it's splitting between my computers. Oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, moving on. Uh, so one thing I did want to share with you, it is cloudy here in Central Florida tonight, um, as for most of the country for that matter, but I did get some footage from the last time it was clear here. So I'd want to share that with you. And uh, in the theme of Mars, you know, we're excited about the Perseverance landing and I'm coming to you live from underneath the, uh, the rover right now. Actually, I'm in uh, Merritt Island, Florida. Uh, but things that are red in the sky besides Mars, are a lot of nebulas that are made of uh, excited hydrogen atoms in the sky and these glow red in the night sky. So I want to start off with the jellyfish nebula, which looks like this in a long exposure photograph. And it kind of looks like a jellyfish. And I'll talk more about what it is in a moment here. Let's take a quick look at where it is in the night sky first. Uh, if I can fire up Stellarium here. So if you look at the constellation Orion, pretty much everyone can find that. It's up here just above its club, if you will. It's technically in the constellation Gemini, just above Orion. And up in this part of the sky is where we're gonna be focused tonight. So right now I'm gonna focus on the Jellyfish Nebula, but later on tonight, we're gonna take a peek at the Monkey Head Nebula, which uh, Brian also showed last time, but we're gonna have a little bit of a different twist on it this time around. So let's go ahead and cut to our telescope in the driveway here. This is a uh, roughly an eight inch Mach Newtonian telescope out there that's being remotely controlled from the office here. So from my telescope control software here, I'm just gonna punch in the Jellyfish Nebula and tell it to go find it and point the telescope at it automatically. And off it goes, pointing up in the vicinity of Orion. And once it gets its uh, bearings, it will start to image it. So what's going on here tonight is we have a camera attached to this telescope and it's gonna be taking 30 second exposures over and over and over again of the Jellyfish Nebula. And as these new exposures come in, we're gonna add them together so that over time, we get a clearer and clearer picture as we get more and more time on this object. So it's just now uh, what we call plate solving. So we know it's pointing in the right place. And now we're gonna start that live stacking process where we're gonna start taking those 30 second pictures and stacking them all together to get a live view of what the Jellyfish Nebula really looks like through this telescope. Um, you know, and to set expectations, you know, the pretty pictures you see that have hours and hours of exposure, well, they take hours and hours of time to produce and even more time to process. So what you see live through the eyepiece um, is usually black and white. You know, you can't really see color uh, for objects that are this dim. But for this particular camera, it's a black and white camera anyway, and we're using a special filter to only let through the, um, the actual wavelengths of light that we know this object emits, hydrogen alpha. And we have our first frame coming in right now. We can start to see some of that outer shell of the Jellyfish Nebula. And as we get more and more time, we'll start to see more and more detail on this object. So the cool thing about the Jellyfish Nebula is that it's actually a supernova remnant. Uh, it's actually a star that blew up uh, several thousand years ago. We don't actually know quite how long ago it was. Somewhere between three and 30,000 years is what they say. So there's still a lot we don't know about this object. But... It's really cool. We had this star that blew up basically in a supernova and the gases that were blown out from that explosion are interacting with the gases that were just around the star naturally in these like really weird and complex ways. So as that exploding gas interacted with this really thick part of the molecular cloud around it, it kind of slowed it down and made it bunch up into these really cool filament shapes that you see here right now. And as we get a little bit more time, we'll start to see more and more detail on that. Um, this thing's about 5,000 light years away, um, again, in the constellation Gemini. And uh, technically, it goes by the name of IC443. But it's been a really good target for the professional astronomers, of which I am not one, um, for actually studying supernova explosions and how they interact with the gas around them. So we've got about a minute and a half of time on this right now, and we can really see a little bit more detail there. We can see those uh, tendrils there, of the, uh, the actual shock wave there going through that 
thicker part of the medium, and we're starting to see sort of faint hints of the gas behind it. That's uh, going through sort of a less dense part of that cloud around the exploded star. And we'll give this a, another minute or two, but uh, it does just get better and better as time goes on. Like it takes about 10 minutes to get a really hey, good Frank, picture. Yeah. Somebody was asking what kind of telescope mount and camera you have. Yeah, yeah, I love to talk about my gear. <laughs> Uh, so the telescope is a Skywatcher 190MN. It's a Mac Newtonian design. So basically it's a reflector with a correction plate on the front to um, correct for curvature that you usually get in a reflector. Um, it's kind of a lesser known style of telescope, but it's a really good bang for the buck in terms of image quality and uh, the speed of the telescope. It's a F5. So that means that we can really capture good images like this in not a lot of time. Uh, the mount is a Paramount Mighty mount. Uh, you know, so we got really good tracking going on there. Really the, the hard part of doing astrophotography like this, whether it's doing it live or long exposure, is just being able to track the motion of the stars very, very steadily. And you really need a good solid mount to do that. It's even more important than the camera or the scope. And the camera is an Attic 383L Plus, uh, again, cooled CCD camera, currently cooled to negative 10 degrees Celsius. And there's a beauty shot of it right now, <laughs> pointing at the night sky. So let's take one last look here at the jellyfish here before we uh, cut back to Amy, zoom in a little bit at those filaments. And I just think it's so cool that you can actually see this stuff. So the way this is working is that what we're seeing is ionized hydrogen atoms here. I hydrogen gas is being lit up by ultraviolet light within this nebula. And because that's being ionized at a very specific wavelength, we have a special filter on that camera that only lets that wavelength through. So it's a good way of cheating if you're in an area that has a lot of light pollution because it really filters out a lot of that light pollution and just lets through the, uh, the picture of the nebula that you're trying to, to image. So both planetary and uh, emission nebulas, is what we call this kind of nebula, are really good things to look at if you are living in a more light polluted area. It's always better to not have light pollution in the first place, but if you do, um, there are techniques for you know, still enjoying the night sky, even if you uh, don't have the luxury of living you know, in the desert, like some of our co-hosts here, of which I'm quite jealous. Let's cut back to that uh, image of the jellyfish. And when we come back later tonight, I will jog over a couple of degrees in the sky and we'll take a look at the monkey head nebula after that. So back to you, Amy, if you're ready. I am. Now, now I've got it figured out, I think. We, we hope I've got it figured out. I am not the uh, traditional uh, PowerPoint presenter, so that's not where I have gained my fame. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> I, uh, what's the worst right. that could happen? All right. I mean, what's the worst that could happen? Exactly what is happening now where <laughs> it it uh, takes my Zoom away from me. Oh, so uh, yeah, that's pretty bad. That's where we are right now, where it Zoom disappears and because it keeps putting it into presenter mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and just share my screen and then I guess put it into um, then put it in to the PowerPoint presentation and we'll see what happens. And you guys can just tell me uh, if it actually happened. Okay. We see it. So are we seeing the presentation? Yes, it actually worked. Wonderful. That's good news. So um, if we have a, a couple of really friendly extra co hosts over here, we'll Hopefully you guys can uh, kind of help with tech since my, my Zoom is missing now. But um, so does everybody out there know who this is? Who is this a picture of? I'm personifying our rover. It's Perseverance. So in case you've been living under a rock, Perseverance made it to Mars yesterday without fail. Um, so much so that uh, this happened. on Google today. So when the presentation is over and, and not right now while we're talking about it, I encourage everyone to go to Google just so you can see that for yourself uh, because it was really exciting um, to get up on Google today and kind of see that happening and see the celebration occurring um, for our new rover and for the Ingenuity helicopter drone making it to Mars. So if you didn't see the landing, let's see if I can get this to, to go. Okay, 
uh, if you did not see what happened yesterday, it almost went exactly like what you're seeing here. So they had already mapped this out at NASA. So if you're unfamiliar with the way that these uh, plans go for getting a rover onto the surface of Mars, they figure it out ahead of time. Now, this was not only illustrated in advance, but they had actually used uh, artificial intelligence software to show them exactly how it should happen. Down to the second, down to touchdown, the number of kilometers per second um, and kilometers per minute that the, that the rover was moving as it was being dropped onto the surface of Mars. And it happened almost exactly like this. There were a few moments there in the seven minutes of terror. If you have not heard of the seven minutes of terror, that's those last few minutes prior to touchdown on the surface of Mars where NASA doesn't really know. Okay, so the rover actually gets to the surface before NASA and those that it got there because there is a time delay. Any of our other presenters out there, what is the time delay? Do you know? Because I forgot just for fun. The time delay right now is 11 minutes. It's about 11 100, minutes. About 125 million miles away from us right now, and it's 11 minutes each direction. It is 11 minutes each direction. So the rover was then sitting on Mars already for 22 minutes. And we were finding out in the aftermath. So uh, that's a long time to not know <laughs> um, what's actually going on. So it was beautiful being able to actually watch this happen and know that all of these moments, okay, so you're looking at this image here and see cruise stage separation, atmospheric entry, um, all the way down to powered descent in the sky crane. And if you were watching, you heard them calling out each of these moments as the rover got closer and closer to the surface of Mars. And so this is a really interesting and important moment for NASA as well. I don't know if anybody remembers back to when Curiosity got to Mars, but that was a really emotional time as well. And the process was significantly different. And so this, uh, this particular rover making it to the surface of Mars marks a really huge turning point in the way that we think about and land rovers on the surface of Mars. Okay. So, let's see. so the rover looks really familiar. And usually when I first show off a picture of Perseverance and I ask, what rover are we looking at? The answer is curiosity. And that's because Perseverance looks an awful lot like Curiosity, but it's a little bit bigger. Okay, just centimeters, centimeters bigger. The thing is, though, it actually weighs 100 kilograms more. And for those of you who don't know what 100 kilograms is in pounds, so if you're living in the United States, that's about 220 and a half pounds. So it's a 220.49 something, something, some infinite number. And that's because it has that robotic arm in the front. Okay, so you're looking at the robotic arm where the pixel X-ray spectrometer is, and that arm also contains a coring drill, and that is really heavy. Uh, Perseverance also has five more cameras than Curiosity on board for a total of 23 cameras. And so those cameras are doing this really significant and important work. Okay, the wheels are thicker too. Okay, so that's a really interesting thing to note. Um, if you know anything about what uh, Curiosity's wheels look like, they're, they're a little bit different pattern. Um, they're made quite a little bit different and they've actually been suffering deterioration. Um, and that was known at the time uh, that Perseverance was being built. And so they were able to sort of figure out what it was that they needed to change to make the Perseverance rover have a longer lifespan on the surface of Mars and be able to do things and go places that Curiosity isn't really able to go to. Now the Perseverance rover, its goal is to study its site, its landing site in detail um, for past conditions, past conditions on the surface of Mars, um, seeking out signs of past life. So its primary goal is actually to look for signs that life once existed on the surface of Mars. 
And so it's a part of its mission is to collect rock cores and soil samples, things that look cool. Okay, so if you're anything like me and you're a little bit like a crow, uh, it's looking for I call it the shiny things, right? So it's looking for really weird rocks. And we're going to talk about those in just a minute here. Um, and then a future mission might be able to collect those rocks and weird things and then bring them back to Earth for a detailed study. So basically, uh, I would call perseverance like the geocacher. And it really is. It's like a geocaching mission. Um, and um, if you were unaware, and I don't have a picture of this right now, but um, if someone, if one of the other presenters wants to queue it up and we can show in a little bit, um, there was a, a panel on the rover and it's a little bit of a, a laugh because there's a geocaching message on on one of the panels um, on the rover. So it's a, um, definitely they are looking for the next mission with human beings to come back and collect things uh, that this rover has been caching. Okay, so just a really fun little tidbit for you guys there. Um, Perseverance is also there to test technologies that are needed for the future human and robotic exploration of Mars. Uh, so what you're looking at here on the screen now is the different types of instrumentation, the main instrumentation, okay, that is on the rover. And I don't think um, tonight we really have time to talk about everything that's going on, but you can sort of start to look at um, some of these different things. So if you look particularly at the MOXIE, okay, so it produces oxygen from Martian CO2. So I'm going to call out to our other presenters tonight. Why, why would we want to try to produce oxygen from Martian CO2? Well, I would right. say for, for two reasons. One, uh, if we have um, humans there at some point, they're going to want to breathe that oxygen and not carbon dioxide if they want to survive. And then the other reason is, um, is the oxygen could be potentially converted to liquid oxygen to allow a spacecraft from there to have fuel to blast off from Mars at some point. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so you're 100% right. And I feel like Brian's more of an expert in the Perseverance rover um, than I am. He's talked to a lot of kids lately. Um, and of course, we know that we have radar. You see the radar on their weather station. You guys, why do we want a weather station? Why does our rover need to know what the weather is? I'm calling out to presenters. I'm quizzing everyone. It's like uh, Friday night quiz time. One of you knows. I'm just going to guess, you know, we want to know if a dust storm's coming at least, right? I mean, I would say yes. <laughs> it's important. Mm-hmm. Well, and tracking weather patterns on the surface of Mars is also important for future missions as well. Okay, we don't want to become, um, oh shoot, who was uh, Matt Damon's character in The Martian? Mark Watney. There you Thank go, you. Mark Watney. Nice, good call. Mark Watney, we don't want to leave Mark Watney without a, uh, an understanding of Martian weather. <laughs> So everything that is everything on this rover, everything about this rover is meant to help us to better understand what past life, excuse me, I'm eating my good luck peanuts from the mission yesterday to help me get through the presentation successfully. And I'm choking on one. <clears throat> Ooh. Backfired. Now my sister's calling, so my computer's gonna ring. Um, <laughs> right in the middle of the presentation. Hi sister, she's out there probably watching too. Um, <clears throat> So everything about this rover is meant to, one, tell us about potential past life on the surface of Mars, and then also help us to prepare to put human life on Mars. How cool is that? That this rover there in the present is both exploring the past and preparing for the future. I bet not a lot of people really think of it that way. Amy. Okay. Yeah, I had a question and didn't see any solar panels on there, but I think I read that this is powered by plutonium. Uh, do you know how um, long the plutonium power pack will last on it? I don't know the answer to that, Brian. Do you know how long the, the power systems are built to last on the rover? Well, I mean, the, the, the mission duration <laughs> is scheduled for at least the battery uh, pack. 
yeah yeah so the the well the mission duration is scheduled for at least one mars year so what's that 600 and some earth days um but i want to say it was something like it could last for up to 10 years that plutonium they, there there are though um i don't know if you've shown it but um the the little helicopter drone that um perseverance brought with it called ingenuity um mm -hmm. that does run from solar panels its own it doesn't pull um it doesn't pull electricity from yeah, it's still, um, propeller yeah. up at the top of the solar panel, right? Yep, exactly. I'll look that up, though. I think it was, I think it was uh, for some reason, I have 10 years in my mind. I think you're right. I think you're right, too, but I just, um, that is one I just did not know the answer to today. Um, so we don't have to worry well, about dusty solar panels then, anyway. I mean, at least for the helicopter, yeah. Um, you just don't, we still have to worry about dust for this particular rover. Um, you know, there are, um, which uh, rover is out there? Here's a quiz for everyone. Which rover is out there that is buried? Not talking about opportunity. Come on, you guys. It's on the screen now. <laughs> Pick one. <clears throat> Pick one, Pathfinder. <laughs> why not? Pathfinder. <laughs> I like when we're a little more uh, informal with these presentations. I'm, it's not uh, actually buried. I'm in a it Jeopardy, up. you guys. Do, 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 do. Feels like it's got to be either one of the Vikings or Pathfinder for sure. Yeah, didn't Mark Watney dig up Pathfinder in the movie? Yeah, I, we know I think it was. Yeah. Did, so. I think yeah, it was. okay. See, I was waiting. I was like, everyone who has watched. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So, what we're actually looking at is the locations. Okay. Um, the where on the geography of Mars. Um, our different rovers are situated, okay? So this map also shows, you know, um, of course they're in bold, we see Perseverance, and we see that is the position. So this is where Perseverance is actually doing its science work. Get okay, pretty far away from curiosity, pretty far away from insight, right? So this is a totally different type of mission. And the goal is completely different, right? So that is why Perseverance has to have a place all of its own. Okay, and I'm going to show you this uh, little video, I hope, from NASA. Hopefully, it will play. And go. And go. Apparently not. Apparently, we're not going to go. So <clears throat> we will skip over that. Maybe we'll skip over it. OK. So 3.5 billion years ago, the Jezero crater on Mars actually, they think, would have been filled with water. It was a lake. So what you're looking at here is what it probably looked like in that time period. And what happens when we have liquid water? What do we believe about liquid water? We believe- Bacterium. That, huh? Bacteria that grows. Bacteria grows. Okay, so I want to share something today. I shared it uh, earlier this week in another event, but scientists very recently drilled through 3,000 feet of Antarctic ice. Okay, and it's really important to understand. That means 3,000 feet down through ice on the Antarctic shelf, and they found life. Okay? And that's really important to understand for what we're talking about tonight and why that is important in the context of perseverance and what perseverance is trying to do. Um, because we think of life, right? Like we think when we think of like plant life, for example, we think of photosynthesis. So to make plant life, we have to have photosynthesis. We take light and we turn it into food, okay? On the ocean floor in some really inhospitable locations, there are methane, leaks in the ocean floor in these odd inhospitable locations where plant life and, and microbes are being generated through chemosynthesis. Okay, so they're taking that chemical element and they, they are turning that into food. So clear over under the Antarctic shelf, 3,000 feet down, this little camera discovered plant life, microbes, nowhere near a methane leak. Nowhere. There's no heat down there, so it's not some sort of thermosynthesis. 
And that means that this life is, it's not only generating there, but it's thriving there and it does not have any type of synthesis in the way that we understand synthesis, in the way that we understand how to generate food and to be able to survive. And yet there it is. So they have a lot of studies that they have to be able to do because you, know, you really need to get up close and personal with this, this life matter to understand how that is possible. But when you think about that, if you're thinking about what could be under the surface of Mars, because as we know, uh, Insight was trying to drill down on what happened. We hit some stuff we couldn't drill through. Okay, so we have a problem, all right? And, uh, but life generated in these inhospitable locations like this really, you know, freezing cold water or past water or ice deposits under the surface of Mars, that's going to leave behind evidence. Okay, so today the uh, Jezero crater looks like this. And what you're looking at on the left-hand side is that delta. So um, from the previous image um, up in the uh, upper left, Okay, so that upper left portion above the lake, you're now looking at that to the left, um, really in this image, that big huge delta, and that's what would have fed water um, and allowed it to spill into the lake, and now it's this huge crater, okay? And the, the crater was actually created by something hitting the surface of Mars, um, and then the water, you know, flowed down into that space. So there were, at the time this mission started, they had 60 candidate locations. 60 on, on the entire surface of Mars. So we're looking at that and, and Jezero rose to the top because it looks like a place where, hey, maybe we might find something. And this is not a decision that was made lightly. So it took five years to make the decision that this is the, where we were going to land this rover. This is where NASA was going to target. And so a lot is riding on this um, to use this space to determine whether or not ancient life existed <clears throat> in any form. So our first landing yesterday, for those who uh, got to watch, this was you know one of the very first images um, taken. So this is the Mars viewer screen, and you're actually seeing that very first image and seeing like, okay, everything's working. Um, we're actually seeing the surface of Mars. It looks really familiar. And I don't know if to anybody else it looks really familiar, but to me, it looks a lot like other photos we see of Mars, right? So we know where we are. I was particularly impressed by the shadow of our rover. Okay, we didn't find life in moment one. Okay, so I just wanna point that out, okay? Now, uh, what you're looking at here, by the way, um, because I wanna go back and talk a little bit about like that search for life, okay? These are rocks in the shoreline of Lake Salda in Turkey, okay? And these were formed, so if you're looking at that, I know the photo is a little bit blurry because I had to blow it up um, quite extensively, but if you look there, you can actually see that it looks pitted. Okay, so that rock surface looks a little bit porous. And that's because these rocks were formed by minerals, or excuse me, microbes, not minerals, microbes that trap <laughs> minerals and uh, sediments in the water, okay? So those, those things come together, the minerals and the sediments pull together because of these microbes and they create these rocks, okay? So NASA actually used this as an analog for some of the things that they might be searching for, okay? So Perseverance is going to be up there and sort of looking for something that looks an awful lot like these ancient microbial fossils um, that exist on Earth. And, and this kind of rock formation, it doesn't just exist in Turkey. We see things uh, that are made by cyanobacteria, right? Cyanobacteria often create this like yellow look. I mean, I don't know for sure what the, the rocks in Salda were made by, if it was a cyanobacteria or something else. But even in Utah, right? So in the, the Virgin River in uh, the state of Utah in the United States, has uh, rocks that were formed by sediments and minerals coming together as a result of cyanobacteria. Um, so we can see those types of analogs all over Earth. And so it's a really good analog for them looking at Mars and saying, okay, well, if there was a water 
a water basis on Mars, my microbial life would then have cre maybe created something that looked like this. Okay. So uh, the other thing they were looking at was stromatolite. Okay, and, and that's what you're looking at now. So you see that penny in the, the upper left, just to kind of show you the size of what a stromatolite looks like. And one of their biggest hopes is that what they're going to find is not something that could have been created by a geological force. So if you have seen recently uh, the dunes, uh, all of the news stories about the dunes on Mars, and those are created by winds and geological forces, they're really looking for something that could not have been created by a geological force, but instead only by ancient microbial life. Okay, so a stromatolite, which is what we're looking at now, was uh, those are created, those happen on Earth, of course, and they are caused by mo microbial life that exists along ancient shorelines or existed, excuse me, along ancient shorelines and in other environments on Earth where metabolic energy and water were both plentiful. So water is really important to the story of what Perseverance is trying to look for on the surface of Mars. So it would be really, really difficult, okay? And NASA has pointed this out a few times for something like a stromatolite to be attributed to geological forces. We couldn't look at this and say, yeah, wind did that or um, erosion made that happen. It's, we can see very clearly evidence of the pitting um, and colorization that happens as a result of the interventions of microbial life. So I think I mentioned to you, you know, maybe we haven't found life yet, um, but a bunch of people on Twitter really do believe that we found some life on Mars. Hoping that someone out there is laughing that we have found Bernie on Mars. Uh, Nick Floor at the University of New Mexico, I believe, um, and a number of other people, put, uh, you know, saw Bernie. Um, of course, we see our our friend Matt Damon, and <laughs> um, reading that tweet always makes me laugh. And then, of course, Darth Vader has uh, made it to Mars as well. And so it looks like, uh, I believe Frank has already showed off Mars this evening. But uh, this is the end of our presentation. So Amy? Oh, am I showing you guys my whole computer now because my phone is being weird? Okay. Uh, so Amy, Amy, there's a question yeah. in the chat. Uh, Kristen wants to know, are the images from Mars showing a curve because of the type of lens used? Oh. I don't know which camera took this, but yes. Usually the lenses, so Kristen, you're out there. So usually, and this is true for like, a, and, and if one of the other presenters knows and I'm wrong, please tell me. Um, so uh, usually the lenses have a, a round um, front on them. So it's not like a, you know, if you think about your camera, it has a bit of a curvature to the front and this would be like a fisheye lens. Does anybody else know for sure which camera it was? I don't know for sure which one it was, but it's it's definitely a fisheye lens for sure. Yeah. So, uh, um, and there's a number of different cameras, so that's not always going to be the case. Okay. So um, some of them have a, a little more normal curvature, so they're not all a fisheye lens. So we'll see something different um, at different times throughout the mission. What's really cool too on this one is I think it's something like 53 cameras that it's got on board, and it was using seven cameras during. Uh, entry, descent, and landing. And, and I think they're talking about maybe on, on this Monday releasing video footage of the landing itself, which would be awesome to see. So fingers crossed on that All one. Right. Cool. All right. I'm going to unshare. And then I think uh, if we're passing it back to Frank, or are we passing to Brian? I can do one more if you want. Go get him, Frank. All right. Go ahead and do one more. And then uh, Brian can queue up and we'll be. All right. Yeah, and it, like if you look at my background too, this is actually the first color image that came back today from Mars. Let me uh, turn myself off, and you can definitely see that fisheye uh, effect going on in this image too. But there you have it, guys. The uh, the very first color image coming in today from Perseverance. But back to Earth here. Let's go back to our telescope in the driveway here, 
And uh, last time, Brian showed us some really pretty pictures of the monkey head nebula. And uh, I got one of my, my own here too. Kind of looks like one of those Wizard of Oz, monkey, mo Wizard of Oz monkeys there, you know? Like, um, to me, like I see a smile there and like the head up here. I don't know, anyway. But let's take a look at what it looks like in the actual night sky. So let's go ahead and point our telescope at the monkey head nebula. It's just a little bit away from the... Um, from the jellyfish that we were looking at earlier. So the same part of the sky, it's actually technically in the constellation Orion. So let's go ahead and point the telescope at it here. Again, I'm just gonna command my scope from the office here to go point at it and start taking pictures from the camera that's attached to the telescope. So what's gonna happen here, if you uh, missed our earlier segment, uh, every 30 seconds, we're gonna have a new image come in from that camera that's attached to the telescope. And we're gonna keep adding those pictures together to get a clearer and clearer picture as time goes on. So right now we've uh, made sure that we're pointing in the right part of the sky and we're gonna kick off that series of images. It's called live stacking. And uh, we're gonna set up that 30 second exposure time there. And we're using a special filter to actually only let through the wavelengths of light that we know that this object emits most strongly. So we're gonna see a black and white image here because we're just letting through one wavelength. You know, it, we get those pretty pictures that I showed you earlier by doing long exposures over several hours through multiple filters. So uh, when we make a pretty picture like the one Brian showed last week, you know, we're doing that through multiple filters and combining that together after the work to make a really pretty color picture. But let's wait for that first 30 second image to come in. It's just about done. And uh, this, uh, I'm kind of surprised more people don't know about this nebula. You know, it's really a pretty one and it's relatively bright. You know, even with that first 30 second exposure here, we're starting to see something, right? You can kind of see that monkey head is a little bit on its side there. Oh, it is on its side. Although some people see it in different ways, you know, that's, uh, it's kind of like looking at uh, clouds in the sky and people see different shapes and different things. It's all in your head, of course, but it does make it uh, a little bit more interesting. But yeah, already we're seeing a lot of that structure of the gas of this nebula. And earlier we looked at the jellyfish nebula, which was a supernova remnant the monkey head nebula is not that. It's not a supernova remnant at all. It's just what we call hierarchical collapse. So it's just this cloud of gas is kind of coming together under its own gravity. And within it, we have this little cluster of stars that's forming as a result of that. So this is how baby stars are born. Bump up the brightness of it a little bit there. And you can see that gas a little bit more clearly. But as this gas comes together, these new stars are forming in the center of it as it uh, that gas collects and new stars can like be formed out of that fresh new gas. And ironically, you know, when enough of these stars actually form that uh, the solar wind from those stars just kind of blow it away. So it's kind of like this cycle of death and rebirth going on, if you will. Uh, but yeah, that's the monkey head. And already with just a minute and a half of time here, we're starting to see some really cool detail. Um, I'm really starting to see that it's really starting to approach uh, the quality of that final picture. Um, you know, at this point, you're just going to see less and less noise in the image as we get more and more exposure time. So let's wait for another uh, exposure or two to come through, and then we'll call it good. Four, three, two, one, and our next exposure for two minutes of time should be in. And if you look closely, as that gets added in, we see that the, uh, the noise in the background went down a little bit, and it made it a little bit easier to see the, the monkey head nebula itself. So again, this is one of my... Uh, one of my favorite objects these times of the winter sky, we're kind of like coming at the end of nebula season right now where the plane of the Milky Way is really positioned well overhead right now to see these objects that are within our own galaxy. Um, as we go into the spring, we'll be entering galaxy season. So next month, we'll probably be looking at some galaxies as we start to look outside of our galaxy and out toward other more distant galaxies uh, out there beyond our own. So we'll be collecting even more ancient photons next time around. Uh, a little bit of monkey head nebula trivia here. Let's see how far, 6,400 light years away. So speaking of distant, uh, the, the light we're looking at right now took 6,400 years to get here. And uh, if you think about what was going on on Earth 6,400 years ago, uh, not much when it comes to humans, right? Or not much that we know about. It's a long time ago. It's just uh, mind boggling how far back we're looking here, not only in distance, but also in time. So yeah, a telescope is basically a time machine too. And with that, I'm gonna... Cut back to our final image there of the monkey head nebula, uh, where the blue part is actually ionized oxygen and the red is ionized hydrogen. And you can see that in the center of that, we have uh, a lot of oxygen going on in addition to hydrogen to make this really beautiful picture. And with that, I'm gonna cut back and uh, hand it over to Brian for, uh, for your red themed objects of the evening. 
Sadly, I don't have them in red color, but um, I'll make it work. All right. So well, we know me... they're red. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So yeah. Hey, everyone. My name is Brian Cummins. I'm also an amateur astronomer. I'm from Chantilly, Virginia. Um, I presume I'm sharing my screen. Just want to make sure. Um, yeah. I'm also good. I'm also a member of the Nor Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, which is one of the, if not the biggest, one of the biggest um, astronomy clubs in the country. Um, and if you don't live in Northern Virginia, look up for a local astronomy club near you. If you want to go out, look at their schedule for public nights where you can go out and look through uh, people's telescopes. Um, we have a loaner program where you can borrow telescopes, take it and go look through it on your own and bring it back when you're finished with it. You may have similar things. And, and you know, uh, astronomy clubs all over the, the country have uh, public nights where you can come out, look at people's hardware, see what they've got. And, and if you're trying to make a decision about what type of telescope to buy, it's a great opportunity to go out and do that. So I'm going to share some of my images with you tonight, including one that I'm just sort of finishing that I'm really proud of. It's the biggest one that I've worked on ever. Um, this is, um, I know there are people interested in, uh, in the rigs uh, or the equipment that's being used. Um, this is a picture of my gear. Unfortunately, I'm not out tonight. It's cloudy and snowy and slushy, so <laughs> not great conditions to go out and do astronomy. Um, but these are the these are uh, two of my telescopes, and you might ask, um, okay, well, why have two different ones? The question is, why not have more? Um, but the the they they're really two different tools for for two different types of purposes. Um, uh, this refractor telescope, the one on the left, the, the white one, is a 127 millimeter uh, Explorer Scientific um, refractor. Um, it it gives a it, uh, it has a, a, a shorter focal length, and so that gives you sort of a wider field of view in the sky. So for for viewing a larger patch of, in the sky, for taking pictures of a larger area in the sky, it's a it's a good tool for that. Um, the one that's in the back here is an eight-inch uh, Schmidt-Cassegrain telescope. Um, the, 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 the refractor is on an equatorial mount, which is great for deep sky photography. It, it helps us to track and, and stay on targets for long periods of time over many nights. Um, this, this one in the back, the Schmidt-Cassegrain, is on, on an alt as mount, um, which is really good for visual, very easy to use. And, and what I use um, the Schmidt-Cassegrain for, it's got a much longer focal length, so it allows me to get a lot better magnification. And so I use uh, that for things like um, planetary type photography. So I know Frank showed an awesome picture of Mars. So I won't show that, but I'll show you a couple of things. And I, I figured what I do is I'll start with a couple that came off the Schmidt Cassegrain, sort of close to Earth. Um, and this first one is one I took. Let me see if I can do that better. Yeah. So this is one I took over the um, summer of the International Space Station. Um, I was really happy to get this photo. It's not. It wasn't an easy one for me to get. I sort of had to guide by hand and and aim on the target. Um, but you know, you can pretty clearly see the the solar panels here and the body of the International Space Station. Um, given that it's traveling over Earth at about altitudes, I think at 254 miles, and it's traveling over 17,000 miles an hour, I was really happy to um, get that picture. I've I've tried a number of times and and failed, so it was it was awfully good to get that. If you're interested in seeing the ISS, not this, uh, not like this, but you can see that easily naked eye if you know sort of where and when to look. And I think if you go to, I want to say it's um, track the station, maybe something like that. Um, if you look for uh, on, you can Google it, look at any search engine and look for uh, something like, you know, tell me where, when the ISS is passing overhead. And you can even get text messages that'll alert you when it's passing overhead and will be visible. So satellites like this are, are best seen uh, close to dusk, close to dawn. Um, because it's dark on the ground, but the sun is still shining up and, and, and reflects off of, of satellites and, and easily naked eye, you can see ISS traveling overhead. It, 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 if, if you don't know what it is, it looks like almost, you know, an airplane um, traveling overhead. It's, you know, from a distance anyway, because it's, it's relatively bright. So I will close that. Um, also with the schmidt cassegrain it's also very good for planetary images. So this is an image I took of, of Jupiter. Um, a couple years back, and it happened to be a great night for, for taking pictures of planets. Uh, to get good planetary images from Earth, you need uh, very stable um, atmospheric conditions, which we call good seeing. If, if, if the atmosphere is distorted, it's, it's a little like 
you know, when you look over the top of a grill and everything kind of looks wavy, um, when you look at, at planets in particular, things like that, um, especially planets, um, as you look at them through a telescope, if the seeing isn't good, it looks really wavy and kind of comes in and out of focus. And that's just from an effect of the uh, atmospheric disturbance. Happened to catch this on a night when um, there was good seeing and we had the eye of Jupiter facing us, which is uh, which was it worked out great. So that was one of my favorite pictures. So I figured what I would do is go next to um, a few deep space images. Um, and I'll show you, the first one I'm going to go to is NGC 2359. Um, it's called Thor's Helmet. And I thought I'd start with an image similar to what Frank was pulling, um, a black and white image. And this is a single exposure that has come in. And when we do astrophotography, typically um, we'll take multiple exposures. This one was, does it say? Yep. This one was uh, four minutes. Um, and and the idea is you take lots of, of sub exposures of, of four minutes, sometimes three minutes, five minutes, depends on the object you're shooting. And you stack those using software to put together a, a color image. And what this does is, I don't know if you can see it, I'll zoom in, but you can see it's kind of grainy and there's not a lot of detail. Um, as, you, as you stack more sub exposures, you get a much uh, clearer and brighter picture. Um, and so what I'll show you is this is sort of a finished version of Thor's helmet. And you can see just a lot more detail in there. Um, so Thor's helmet is about 75, excuse me, about 12,000 light years away from Earth. It's in Canis Major. And it's got this cool sort of bubble effect going on with these cool filaments. And and looks a little like the helmet the Thor wears, I guess, with the feathers that come up. So that's uh, that was a cool image to shoot. That is... In Canis Major, it's up right now. It's a good target to be shooting about this time of year. So I thought I would share that with you. The next one I thought I'd share um, is from the constellation Orion, aptly named the Orion Nebula. I think I showed this last month as well, but it's it's a really cool object to see in the sky. And in fact, um, interestingly enough, my dad called me last night and said, hey, what's that thing in Orion that's sort of down below the bell, but this sort of fuzzy area? Um, and that's the Orion Nebula. You can, uh, when you look in the sky, you can see that naked eye. It sort of looks like this sort of smudgy, uh, fuzzy area. Uh, but when we turn our cameras on it um, and, and expose for a long period of time, uh, you can get something like this. And so, um, so Orion is about 1300 light years from Earth. It's about 24 light years across. And this is uh, similar to one that Frank showed earlier. This is a stellar nursery. So you got these massive areas of gas and dust and these that create these sort of beautiful, beautiful images. And, and these, the gas and the dust is being um, ionized, or excuse me, the gas is being ionized by some of the stars here in the middle. And that causes them to throw off uh, a frequency of light that we can capture and see that as color um, with our cameras. And so uh, this is one of my favorite images and one of my favorite things to look at in the night sky through a telescope. If you, if you, look, if you looked at this through a telescope, if you haven't had the opportunity to look through a telescope and see, it won't quite look like this. Your eye is not nearly as sensitive as the camera is. And of course, you're viewing it in real time instead of long duration uh, photography. But, you know, when I look through it at a telescope on good clear nights from a, from a nice dark site with a lot of light pollution, I do definitely see sort of a greenish, grayish type color. Um, it's, it's a really cool thing to see and, and very up high in the sky um, this time of year. Uh, so I'm also going to go somewhat near uh, Orion. This is the Rosette Nebula, one of my favorite images as well. Also in a mission nebula. Um, and you can see just these huge areas of, of, um, of dust and gas uh, with a star cluster at the center that I think is what's happening is it's the, the, the energy from the stars is sort of blowing out that sort of uh, donut shape in the middle and just creates this very cool, looks a little bit like a flower uh, type image. So one of my, one of my favorite photos that I've, I've taken over the years. Um, the last one I'm going to show tonight, not red themed, but it is uh, sort of the season for, I guess we just passed Valentine's Day. Um, I just finished this image. Well, I wouldn't say I'm done with it, but I'm getting close to done with it. Um, this is the Heart Nebula. Uh, this is a really big emission nebula in Cassiopeia. It is about 7,500 light years from Earth. 
and you can see again this these huge areas of of hydrogen and oxygen gas that are being illuminated it's an emission nebula that are being illuminated by these sort of stars in the in the central core of this so this one was a huge project for me um because it's so big and the field of view of my camera is isn't nearly big enough to between the the combination between my telescope and my camera you know gets a smaller frame field of view than than this whole object takes up so this one i had to uh i did this as a four panel mosaic meaning i had to take four individual images and then eventually stitch them together much like you would um much like you would a quilt but you do it electronically and certainly not with sewing um and and so to get this image took um an extraordinary long period of time i started working on this thing and i, I did the math earlier i gotta find it um so I, I started working on this on october 2nd and i've spent 14 nights between then and now gathering data uh, and i have over 48 hours of exposure time in this one image so roughly about 12 hours per if you, if you break this up into rectangles um, e each of those is an image um, so yeah, that was, um, it was a lot of work. Uh, I'm almost done. I think I, I still have some tweaks to it, but I, I told Amy, I'd try and bring the heart nebula tonight since we're kind of close to Valentine's day. And I don't know, you can remember the love of your life or long lost love or something like that. Um, and you know, it, it's so big. In fact, that even down here in this corner, um, is, and I'll sort of zoom in on that is sort of considered an object in and of itself that people image, uh, it's called the fish head nebula. So you can sort of see, it seem, seems to me like sort of a fish hanging down. Um, so yeah, this this image, I'm, I'm, I don't wanna say I'm quite done with, I don't know, maybe it's sort of like when you're, I don't know, you write a song and you're never quite done with it, but uh, so I still have some work to do on it, but I wanted to at least share it tonight because uh, I'm finally glad to be done gathering data on it so I can move on to another project, but I wanted to share it with all of you tonight. So. Um, I think that's all I had tonight, but um, Amy, thanks very much for having me. Hey, I just, no questions came across, but I, I developed a question when Frank was talking, so maybe Brian, you or either, but Frank mentioned sure. that we're coming out of the uh, nebula season and going into the galaxy season. I guess I've never heard that before. I'm not a big astronomer but maybe you could explain that a little bit more yeah so as you you know it, it, as you think about think about it and it, it, as we as we are rotating around um the sun you know we find ourselves pointing at different parts of the sky um you know different parts of space as when it's dark at night and so which is why we see we're able to see different constellations at different times of the year um, and it happens that, you know, this time of the year is, is we're pointing very much into a lot of great nebula, nebulas uh, within our own galaxy. And as we get more to the summer and we're looking out into a different part of space from our vantage point, um, we can see a, a lot more galaxies. So, um, and I think I, like the one in the background that John has up that you'll see in a minute that, that's behind him. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is a great time of year. Um, you've got the Orion Nebula, some of the ones I showed, the Crab Nebula. Um, geez, there's there's tons, right? There's the Seagull Nebula. There's all kinds of uh, nebulae that are available to go um, to go look at and to image. Uh, summer is a great time to to go after um, galaxies for sure because there are a lot more that are available that are higher in the sky that we can image and it's always better if you can to shoot something that's high in the sky because you're shooting through a lot less atmosphere right if it's down low on the horizon you're shooting through an awful lot of horizon a lot of air and atmosphere to get there where the higher up you are the better it is uh, better quality images typically thanks that helps me <laughs> no problem <laughs> can uh, see it a little bit better there. Um, don't see any more questions. Um, I don't know whether Amy comes back on, but uh, John, I think we're up to you going out to- uh, I'm here. Central. I'm just okay. being quiet <laughs> <laughs> for a change. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. From uh, Central Arizona there in Prescott, I think I said it right that time, John, Prescott, Arizona. Uh, I think you did. 
Prescott Air uh, Astronomy Club. Uh, it's all yours. All right, let me get to my screen sharing going here. Once I find the right one, there we are. So what I'm gonna be showing you tonight is a couple of pictures that were taken by one of the members of the Prescott Astronomy Club. His name is David Vischio. And he's a chemist actually, um, but he recently got, and not recently, he's been involved in astronomy for some time. And I've been enamored a little bit by what he's doing. And he took a couple of images of Mars just recently. Actually, it was last October that I'm gonna be sharing with you. So first uh, we have Prescott Astronomy Club here in Prescott, Arizona. And Prescott is actually pronounced like C-I-T-T, -T, like a biscuit, Prescott, Arizona. Uh, I learned that when I moved here back in, in 2006. So first I'm gonna give you an idea of what it took for David to capture that image. To start with, his camera was a DSLR, uh, Canon 6DA. Now the A means that it was modified specifically for astronomy. I used to have one of those myself and I gave it up for other cameras. So his optics that he used was a six inch Celestron, that's the C6. It's called an SCT, which is uh, now he added on top of that a 1.6 image amplifier, which gave him a, a focal length of an F ratio of 16 instead of the typical F ratio of 10, which is what that six inch telescope normally has. Then he moved uh, his computer with an Apple MacBook Pro, and he's using a very old version of the operating system. He's one of these guys that says, if it works, don't fix it. And his camera that he was using was a Canon EOS utility, came with a camera. So he's just using the basic stuff that comes with it. The camera mode that he had it in was a 640 by 480 video mode. And then his video capture, he took five minutes. So he literally just honed in on this object for five minutes at 60 frames per second. And he had two images, one at 400 ISO and one at 800 ISO. So either one of these would work for um, a lot of planetary. And it was in a 8-bit color movie format, MOV, which is the output for that particular software. Now the processing that he went through, first he had to convert the MOV format to AVI. So after converting the MOV to AVI, then he could stack that image using Auto Stacker. It's just an application I think it's a free application. And what it does is it yields a 16-bit color TIFF image, T-I-F-F. -F. Now, the T-I-F-F -F just simply means that it's a high resolution. It's not compressed. It's basically a raw image. And we, we always want a raw image to work with when we're dealing with um, astrophotography. Then he had to align the red and the blue channels to the green channel. Now, the reason for that is when you're looking through a telescope that is not actually um, an Apple um, APO telescope, it's really designed specifically so that all the red, green, and blue channels or the, the frequencies come together at a single point at the chip. So he had a little bit of trouble with that and he had to literally shift the red and the blue a couple of pixels to get them to line up with the green channel. So you'll see some of that in the image. And then he went through the wavelet processing using Registack 6, which is another free application. Wavelet processing is literally a way to sharpen the image at different frequencies. There's about six steps, five or six steps that you can go through. And each step is a different frequency and you're just tuning it to try to get the sharpest image that you can. Then he did a final contrast and other um, processing using Adobe Photoshop CS6. So that's the processing that I went through. Here's the image that he got as a result. So this is one image that it was taken at 8.52 PM on the night of October 10th. And that was last year. So I'm gonna show you the next image and we're gonna flip back and forth between the two of these so that you can see what happened. Now this next image was taken a little after 10 o'clock. Notice the shift in the dust lanes going back. There it is at 8.52. 
there it is at 1025. So in that little bit of time, there was a lot of shifting of the dust clouds on Mars. Also, you'll notice down at the bottom, here's the, uh, the polar ice cap and the previous image, it's over there. So notice that there's a little bit of a shift there as there's a, a little bit of libration in the, the image. So that was basically his. You may not be able to see it too clearly, but across the top, there's a slight blue fringe and across the bottom, there's a slight red fringe. Now the other Mars image that, we sh that, that I saw tonight, there was no color fringing in that whatsoever. So that was done with excellent sharp optics that brought all the colors together at a single fo focal point. So now I'm gonna move off of that and show you something a little bit different. This is 10.9 million names that are attached in these microchips that, that went out on the Perseverance. So 10.9 million names are on a microchip attached to a metal plate reading explore as one. So that's the oddity, one of the five oddities of the uh, perseverance that went out. Just thought I'd toss that in. Now here's my observatory in Paulden. I'm actually 17 miles north of Prescott. I'm up in Paulden. I have darker, clearer skies up here than if, uh, if I was down in Prescott down there. They've got quite a sky dome over the city because they're not really paying too much attention to dark sky night. So that's my 10, in, or 10 foot by 12 foot observatory with a roll off roof and inside there is my telescope. Now here's what a, my telescope actually is. It's a 14 inch Celestron Edge HD. Up here on top, I have a 100 millimeter APO telescope. There's my Canon DSLR on the end of it. This is a 60, um, a 60D or 60, I'm sorry, it's a 60, and it's been modified for astronomy as well. Also cooled. There's the camera that I normally would take pictures with. It died last December, so I had to ship it off to China for the third time since I purchased it four years ago. So it's been out for repairs three different times. There's the mount that I have. It's a loss Mandy mount, and I've got each one of these a counterweight that you see here is 22 pounds. So I've got quite a lot of, of weight on here. Now, what I had to do once this camera was uh, had gone defective, what I did is I moved my other camera. I've got a smaller camera that I put actually on the front using a Hyperstar lens. Gives me a, a little bit bigger field of view than this camera on the backside. So that's my setup that I've got right there. If anybody's curious about what this is, um, during the daytime or at night, I can light this up with a, a white light, aim the telescope at it, and I can take what is called a flat that way from inside. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move on. Here's one of the images that I took also last December during the uh, Saturn-Jupiter conjunction. And if you'll notice right in the center, that's actually Uranus. And the three little dots next to it, those are the moons of Uranus. I have never ever taken a picture of any planet other, you know, like Uranus, this totally surprised me. Now the one that you saw earlier that was blue in color, this is, this is a single shot. This is a 20 second exposure, single shot. No attempt was made to try to take a bunch of pictures and combine them together and come up with a pretty blue image like you saw earlier. So this was taken with the QHY128C that died. Now you'll notice the dark black bands that are going horizontally through this. That's the camera, that's, it died. I mean, you can't take reliable pictures with these black bands going through the image like that. So I had to send it back and, and hopefully it'll come back to me in six months, I'll be able to use it again. So here's a close up. I actually took this and I zoomed in on it and there's the close up of Uranus. And see a slight bit of bluish in there. Uh, and, and all of this haze that you see around it, that's because of our atmosphere. The atmosphere actually diffuses the light that comes off the planet. But there's the three moons, very clear. Now there's actually five moons associated with it. Only three of them showed up in this image. You'll probably notice a little streak of light right there. That's a galaxy. So for a 20 second image, that wasn't even, I mean, uh, if when you zoom in on all of this, you'll find 
the objects are a little elongated. So <clears throat> my telescope wasn't even perfectly collimated. Now, we were talking about seeing conditions. So you'll notice here's a star that I was pointing at. This is a video that I'm gonna show you. And it's just gonna let you know what happens when the atmosphere is really a, a problem for looking at any of our images. When we see a star dancing around like that, that's not a good night for, for, for trying to do astrophotography because what the images are gonna do when you stack them, it's gonna combine all of those and give you one big blob instead of something that's a little more uh, defined. So that's, we were talking about seeing conditions and that's, that's how you can identify, do you have good seeing conditions or bad seeing conditions? If the star is dancing around, bad seeing conditions. Now we were talking about, you know, taking different images. Every camera, you have to, we have to take several different types of images when we take astrophotography. One of the first images is called a bias. That's where you close up the cover on the telescope and you take an extremely short image, as short as possible that you can. And that's gonna give you basically a, a, a noise image, a noise pattern that you can subtract from your images. And that's the noise that's generated by the camera itself. So now we do the darks. We cover it up and we expose it for the same period of time at the same temperature as we took the lights. So this exposure here that I'm showing you is done for a very long period of time, probably five minutes. So you'll see a little bit of what we call amp glow in the corners and around the edge. This is typical of a CMOS camera, by the way, seeing an amp glow all the way around the, the edges like this. There are CMOS cameras that don't have any amp glow at all like that. Love to have one. So this next image is gonna be a close up of the center to show you what happens, you know, why are we really taking these darks? Look at all these red, green, and blue pixels in here. These are pixels that are hot. They never turn off, they're always on. And because they're always on, if we were to allow those to show up in our astrophotography images, we would see what look like stars that are red, green, and blue. And they're not stars, they're hot pixels. Now, in some places, there's going to be a black dot, and that's a cold pixel that just never turns on. So we take these bias, we take the darks, we're going to combine those with our lights. So the next image that we take is the flats. That's where we, uh, we want to, like you saw that whiteboard that I had in my observatory. I point my camera at it, and I adjust the light so that the histogram that I see is about at the 50% point. So I'm, I don't have any light coming here, don't have any light coming there. Ideally, this would be a bell curve going straight up and down through the middle. That would be the ideal. And when we have that, then we have what we call a gray image, and we're gonna subtract that or process that out of the image as well. Now, why do we do that? If you'll look around the corners, they're a little bit darker than it is in the center. So these flats, when we combine those with the lights, it allows us to uh, have that image processed to where it's clear the same image luminosity all the way across. So here's another thing about the flats. Every camera, I don't care who it is, what they have, they've got little dust motes inside the camera itself on the lens. And they, they come out showing like donuts. You might be able to see this little donut shape uh, you might have to turn your intensity up on your uh, monitor in order to see that. But there's a little donut shape, and these donut shapes are evidence of a dust moat that's actually somewhere in the light train. Now, after we do that, we take our lights, and here's the lights as an example. And you'll notice it's a little dark around the edges, so when we uh, process the flights with the lights, that, that darkness around the edge will disappear and there'll be the same luminosity all the way through. And hopefully when we're all done with that, we go and we start pre-processing the images. So this is a workflow that we all go through, probably not in this much detail, but it's similar to this. First, we create master darks. We're gonna take like 20 darks. If we take 20 lights, 20 subs, we call them, then we take the same amount of darks. Then we take a master flats. We might take uh, 50 or 100 master flats. 
and we take the master bias. We might take a hundred of these bias images. We create masters of all of those different subs that we've taken. And then we do a star alignment on each of the individual lights that we did. The next we do is a calibration. Calibration is where we combine the darks, the flats, and the bias with our um, uh, lights. And then we integrate that as a result. The integration is where we're combining these, uh, the calibrated images and integrating them. Then we're gonna crop it because once we're doing this integration, none of these images are directly one on top of the other. When we integrate them, they, we're actually having to move the images around and software does this for us. We move the images around and around the edge, we'll see what looks like um, not very good stuff. So we have to crop it out. We might even crop it down even deeper than that. Now we go into post-processing, which is a linear process. And we're gonna do a stretch. Now notice here's what I showed you before. Let's say that this was the actual image and this is what it looked like. We have some light here, we have some light here. This peak up here says it's very light, very, very well lit up. Down here, there's no light, no light here, but then we have light in the other way. So we're gonna do the stretching. Now, the way we do the stretching is we wanna get rid of the stuff on either end, the black and the light. So all the stuff over here is black, all the stuff over here is light or white. So this is what we do. We bring in these uh, pointers and we say, we wanna stop here. So that's, we're gonna just say, ignore all the light that's off, all the detail that's off over here. We bring this one in from the right-hand side. We're gonna say, ignore all of that. And then we stretch it. So this is the actual image that we're gonna be playing with. That's the stretching process. Then we take the background and we process, we try to get rid of the noise in the background. And we try to make the background as smooth as possible. Then we do a deconvolution. The deconvolution is where the stars may look a little bloated. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tighten up those stars a little bit. And that's the deconvolution. Then we work on the color. We try to get the red, green, blue, uh, all the different colors that we're looking for. We process this so that we can get beautiful colors out of our images. And then we add a little bit more noise uh, into it. We don't, not adding noise. We're gonna uh, try to subtract out some more noise that might've been in there. There's luminosity noise, there's color noise. So we work on both of those. And then we combine the images and then we do a pro, once, this is all pre-processing. So now we're gonna do, that should have been, yeah. So now we're gonna do a non-linear post-processing. We're gonna stretch it a little bit more. We're gonna do some more noise reduction. We're gonna do a high dynamic resolution on it. So like HDR, we're gonna see if we can dim down the whites and blow up the, the, the dark images and try to, to get some more, it looks like you know what your eyes would normally see. And then we do a little contrast adjustment. So this is all the processing that we go through to try to get pictures to come out really pretty. And maybe we'll play around with some more color. When we're all done with that, we hope to come up with something that looks like this. So this is a pretty image that was done by Alex Roberts. He's a member of the Prescott Astronomy Club. Uh, and I love the images that he takes. This is a recent one that he took uh, last year. So I just added that to show you what happens when you go through all of that work. It may take you a couple of hours, but when you're all done, you've got something that you're pretty much satisfied with. So that's all I've got for my presentation. I hope it was pleasant for you. Any questions? Well, John, I don't see any questions at this time, but we really appreciate, uh, I think now everybody has an appreciation of what it all takes for you and Frank and Brian and everybody else that comes on here to get these beautiful pictures for us and to look at. So thanks a lot. And I love that and, uh, oh, what happened here? There we go. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna. I'm learning. I'm learning some things. I don't actually know how to do what I want to do. You guys, it's like fri this Friday night's not good for me. <laughs> um, John, it's so great. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. I was just sitting here watching. You know, as as every slide came by, and I'm like, you know, this process is so intricate, and you know, everything that goes into processing out the images so that we actually see the color, we see what images are made out of. And so thank you so much for doing that. 
um, and showing everybody what it really takes to make these images, like the one behind you, like M33, like it takes so much to make that possible so that we can actually see uh, see what is out there. Let me and get out of the way. There are other processes <laughs> that, yeah, yeah, I know, like, you know, um, there are other processes in the professional research centers that go into seeing what uh, what galaxies are made out of, what planets are made out of, what nebulae are made out of. And so, you know, we have spectroscopy and, you know, we have uh, radar and we have, um, you know, we have the Chandra X-ray telescope. And so we see the universe in all of these different ways. And just knowing what it takes just right here on Earth in your own backyard, what it takes to process an image. Um, to see some of the types of things that we see as professional researchers is so cool. And um, and I want to thank all of our presenters for the evening and all of our guests that came out tonight um, to hear what we had to say, to hear from our cat. Um, if you're not here for the beginning, sorry you missed it. Uh, go the, back to the beginning to see all of the Mars stuff I saved on my cell phone in the last two days. <laughs> I found that particularly funny. I'm glad it was mostly Mars photos. <laughs> uh, you know, and cats. My cats were on there. You know, my life is all about space and cats. Okay. Amy? I bet no one could have guessed that. <laughs> hey, Amy? Yeah. I have one thing, last thing, I think, cool. before our viewers get off here. I think we need to brag a little bit about who all, who's been putting this on since the COVID started, Amy, last week, Amy was elected as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society, one of the most prestigious astronomical societies in the world, for her work in dark skies advocacy in educating political leaders to shape government policy in ways that protect astronomical endeavors. So congratulations, Amy. Happy Thank you. I, uh, wow, that's a that's an embarrassing moment. I, <laughs> <laughs> we needed to brag on Thank that. You. That was really um, yeah. It, it means a lot to me that that happened. And um, thank thank you so much um, for telling everybody. It's a yeah. It was a, re a really big moment for me, me and and my cat. We're really <laughs> excited. Yeah, well, I know I know how much you do around this area for dark skies and everything and the the big electronic billboards that everybody wants to put up and so congratulations again thank you thank you yeah so we're much. proud of you, amy that's awesome well Great thanks job. guys <laughs> yeah it was it was a big day i think i, I told all of you maybe all of you <laughs> i immediately went out and that all of our presenters you know we're all we're all good friends and i was just like you guys you have no idea what just happened <laughs> um, <laughs> um yeah that was it was a really big day um for me and it, it was exciting um getting to tell the the Smithsonian about it um, and the Center for Astrophysics, that was that was fun. Right. Um, so thank you again so much. And thank you everyone uh, who came out tonight. Um, please join us again, you know, next month. Uh, I'm gonna call out Frank. Is it, it is you, right? I'm yes. not making that up. No, um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Frank will actually be doing the presentation next month. So I hope you'll all come back and join us in March. And we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.